following program on Other Than a 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. This program also contains the opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The tale of two cities. Sri Lanka, after going through hardships and an insurrection that saw its president fleeing his position, the rebuilders of our nation, basically the same people who got us through this crisis mode, are applying the very same policies that have devastated this country. Right now, we are being told all those suggested, proposed and implemented policies are spot on. We have been told that Sri Lanka now identifies itself as an economically stable nation. But is that the reality? Is that the truth? For insights and analysis tonight, I'll speak to economics professor from the London campus of Lowborough University, Jeffrey Hodgson, Associate Dean of Sorrell College at the University of Troy, Alabama, Professor Alan Mendenhall, Parliamentarian from the Samagi Janabalavegia, Iran Vikramarafna, Chairman of the Committee appointed by the Minister of Justice in relation to the Anti-Corruption Bill, President's Council, Sarah Jaman, Chairman of the Sri Lanka United National Business Alliance, Tanya Abesundra, former chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom Mobitel, Rohan Fernando, and the director of the Belt and Road Initiative in Sri Lanka, Yasiru Ranaraja. Good evening, I'm Mahish Joni, and this is the State of the Nation. Good evening everyone, welcome to the State of the Nation, the show where we dive deep into the political landscape and explore the issues that shape our country. As always, a lot to sort through tonight, so let's get down to business. Since Sri Lanka gained independence, voting has been the method of how we elected our leaders. Every leader who has taken over this country has done just that. They went to the people and played their case. You do a good job, people keep you in power. If you don't, you are sent home. That was even evident to a great president like Mahindra Rajapaksa. Although he won the war, the people of this country chose to send him home. Why? Because he didn't do what the people wanted in the latter part of his second term. It proved that the people of this country truly had the power. They used it in a manner that's superior to any. However, that power was continually displayed in a democratic manner. It was acceptable to all, even all over the world. But last year, a new president took form. This was aided and abated by the self-proclaimed champions of democracy. Was this a new form of voting? Was this a new method of electing a leader as per the norms of the world? Of course not. But the stage was set for these individuals to violate the very sanctimonious purity of our constitution. A leader elected by the highest votes of this country was chased out, we are told, by the very same people who led the insurrection that it was, the need of the hour. And everyone in the country agreed on it. But what is the evidence of that? In any court of law, we can prove that the former president was indeed the victor who gained the highest number of votes for the office of president in 2019, because those ballots still exist. The number of individuals who came to storm the president's house, any donkey on the planet would say that despite the numbers being high in attendance, it does not overshadow the 6.9 million voters of, or even a friction of it. Then we are told, no, 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 no. We need to believe that it reflects more than 6.9 million uh, people's dissent. 
and it was represented there. Can it be approved in a court of law that the 6.9 million uh, people participated in that? And it was indeed their will to chase the president. So then, are we to be okay with the fact that the people's verdict at the polls were discarded due to the hateful needs of a few? Of course, the argument that people all over the nation were unhappy with the former president has some truth to it. Good. The only way we could have tested that theory is to call for a referendum under Article 85 of the Constitution. Yes, our Constitution was even clear as to how we should deal with this matter when the people of this country aren't happy with their leaders. But the action that was carried out doesn't uh, prove that it was the will of the people, rather it was the will of a selected few. I can for a fact say that the will of the people in that awful hour was demanding the former president to do his job and alleviate the suffering of his citizens. Simply put, do what you just promised. Now in America, after the January 6th riots, we know what happened. That incident was very similar to what happened here. American lawmakers swiftly moved towards accountability. Whether you agree or not, there was a process to determine the culprits of that day. Some of are in jail and some are pending investigations. It's past one year since our July 9th. None of the lawmakers, no any NGO for that matter, who claims to be on the side of democracy is calling for any investigation or for any accountability process. And it's hilarious to see that when America is doing their best to punish its unlawful citizens, the American ambassador in Sri Lanka, for that matter, calls them peaceful protesters. We now know that some use the real pain of the people for their gain and manage to become rich. Several were caught recently and official investigations reveal how much money they managed to make uh, during the whole unrest. But are we punishing the real kingpins or are we, as usual, going after the small fish? One year down the line, we need to ask why most are silent on accountability to find out what really happened to this country. Listening to the silence itself tells an alarming story about the fate of this nation. Bobiraka. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. In our lead story tonight, the sudden removal of the Sri Lanka Telecom Chairman Rahan Fernando prompted speculation as to why this move was necessary, necessary at a point where the telco giant was uh, going to sell its shares. In a so-called boardroom coup, the chairman was removed last Thursday. However, he will continue to remain as a board member. Now, this sudden move by the state-run tel uh, telecom giant sparks a question we need answers to. Is this also part of the whole IMF-led restructuring efforts? It's understandable uh, when you want to uh, sell a loss-making entity, but Sri Lanka Telecom is a profit-making entity that has performed very well since the COVID pandemic. Sri Lanka Telecom shares on the Colombo stock market continued to perform well, trading at around 100 rupees per share last week. We need to understand that it's vital that the government continues to be in control regarding the telecommunications aspect of this country. Sri Lanka Telecom is one of the key internet service providers in this nation. Right now, we know that basically all our crucial data gets transmitted via the internet, controlled by these telecommunication service providers. All our personal, bank and customer data gets transmitted every second, every day. There are only six telecommunication service providers in Sri Lanka. Out of, that, uh, out of the six, five are owned by foreign companies. The only company the Sri Lankan people, controlled via the Sri Lankan government, is Sri Lanka Telecom Mobitel. So why the sudden need to sell this Sri Lankan-owned company as well as uh, why are they pushing for a foreign buyer? Those are questions we really need answers to. Is America interested in buying the remaining stake of SLT Mobitel? Is this another attempt by the government to give everything we owe to America? 
well, questions we don't have answers to right now. Let's at least get some clarity to this insanity. Joining me now is the former chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, Rohan Fernando. Good to see you uh, once again, sir. Thank you very much for being here. Now, a couple of weeks back, you came on this very show as the chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom. And today, sadly, you speak to me as a former chairman. You say it's a coup. Can you explain, uh, Mr. Fernando, as to why you think uh, the board made such a harsh decision? Thank you, Mahesh, for inviting me and getting some clarification. Of course, yesterday I had a press briefing and I explained what happened. I am also baffled as to why they had to do it in such a way with, uh, without any notice, unexpectedly removing the chairman. Removing a chairman and appointing chairman is, I believe, it has to be done in a more decent and correct manner. Uh, primarily when traditionally and you know, for a long time it has been happened through the intervention or on the direction of the Ministry of uh, Finance, which of which President is the now the minister in charge and instructions given to the board and the companies through the secretary to the treasury. So when uh, starting this, I wanted to know whether there was any instruction from the treasury. There's absolutely none. Nobody has spoken to me. If they had spoken to me and sent a letter asking me to step down, that would have been the most decent way for a, for a, for a changeover. So I have a question as to why they did in such a hurry and what was the hurry. And the other thing, let's look at the country. There are so many, so many government institutions running at a huge loss with a huge burden to the exchequer and to the nation, to the taxpayers. There are so many chairmen who are non-performing, who are drawing substantial salaries and happily continuing with political patronage. So when all these things are happening, I, I have a question mark and doubt as to why they had to interfere in the SLT uh, for a sudden change and for what purpose. This could not have happened without the knowledge of His Excellency the President because he is the person in charge. Indeed, uh, Mr. Fernando, uh, I've known you for some time and uh, I know you are a very sensible and a rational kind of guy. Why did they need to remove you this way? I mean, I'm puzzled. I'm sure if they come and discuss this with you and their claims were valid, you would have indeed stepped down willingly. It looks like uh, to me, in my opinion, that they want to make this move to tarnish your image and credibility. Perhaps they are afraid of what you would say about SLT that the public isn't aware of at this moment. Also, by pushing for such a move, they can always uh, fall back on this notion that he's no longer credible because he's a disgruntled former employee. Uh, look, Mahesh, there's nothing to be disgruntled about. This is not my job. I am not doing this for a salary. I have my own businesses. I have established my credibility in the marketplace, in the commercial world, and in the sports field also. I mean, my uh, honesty and credibility, I leave it to the people to judge from what I have done and what I have achieved. You don't have to go very far. Three or four years ago, you know where SLT was. It was riddled with corruption. And it was nowhere in the ratings even. Now today, SLT is one of the best performing companies. We were even rated among the, uh, the first, the number eight among the first ten companies. And we have made good profits in 2021. 2022 profits were eroded by a large tax payment of 5.2 billion. And 2023 is going to be a tough year because of the market conditions. Not only SLT, all the other telcos are suffering and we may suffer less. But for your information, I have never interfered in management. It is not my business to interfere in management. I have only given leadership to the company, which the staff will vouch that they appreciate. And from the messages I am receiving right now from all over Sri Lanka, I am, I am so uh, you know, overwhelmed by their appreciation of what I have done for the company. And they are even saying, sir, don't leave the company, stay on the board, which I have to make a decision. Uh, so uh, so I, I think they must be fearing that uh, the, some of the truths will come out. Because there are a lot of corruptions involving at high level, outside Sri Lanka, and people know. And we have not 
pull this out or whatever it is unless we have enough information. Now, actually, if the CID is brought in, some of these things can be unearthed. So, I do not know whether the new management will have the guts and the resolve to do that, especially the new chairman. He is a, he's a astute person. I think he knows what auditing and acquisitions and mergers are. I think I would uh, request him to do that. Indeed, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mr. Fernando, very quickly, uh, what are your thoughts uh, about selling the government stake in SLT Mobita? You see, Mahesh, I have always maintained that it is not up to the chairman or the board of directors to decide whether it should be sold or not. It is up to the shareholders. Now, the shareholders can decide whether to sell it or not because it is quoted in the stock market. There is absolutely no restriction for the government to sell. And I do not know why they have to go through all these uh, you know, tedious processes when they can you know, announce to the marketplace that they want to sell. They must be having reasons, which I respect if it, they are good reasons. If it is because of the security of the company, because of its sensitivity, then they should take that into account and ensure that proper cyber protection laws are in place. So, uh, proper regulation to implement the Cyber Protection Act is in place and also proper cyber security authority is in place. So, I, I presume government uh, and hope government is working in that direction if they want to sell it out to an outside party. Indeed, a uh, lot more to discuss about this issue. Uh, definitely, we will keep the uh, conversation continuing. Mr. Fernando, we had to leave, uh, leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us. Uh, I really appreciate it. That was uh, Rohan Fernando, former chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom Mobitel. Let's take a short commercial break. Be back with more State of the Nation. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now the biggest conversation about our nation's economy is whether the newly proposed parliamentary approved domestic debt restructuring program is good for the little guy. But still, uh, depending whether this move was good uh, for the better health of our nation's economy in the future, the current governor of the central bank, who's the architect of the domestic debt restructuring program, along with the president, the cabinet and the SLPP government, who initially said that they will never go to the IMF, now thinks it's the best deal. Most of us think that the domestic debt restructuring efforts are part of the IMF-led discussions. But sources well known of those discussions tells me uh, that, in fact, the IMF has not requested this restructuring. However, when they were presented with the proposals, they remained silent about it as well. The funny thing is, if the so-called liberal economist and think tanks have been professing so much uh, and telling us how much we should be going to the IMF and asking them to help us to fix our economy, well, one might think that, well, when they help, they will listen to whatever the IMF says, don't you think? Now, the irony is that the IMF, in fact, is advocating against domestic debt restructuring. In an article written in 2021 by Peter Brewer, who is the current lead negotiator for Sri Lanka at the IMF, he says that domestic debt has a high potential of creating losses for the little guy. In his article, he argues, uh, and I quote, On the other hand, domestic debt is often held predominantly by domestic creditors who will suffer losses through this channel, sovereign debt distress can easily spread to domestic bank, banks, pension funds, households and other parts of the domestic economy. This can add to the economic malaise that made the debt restructuring necessary in the first place. So basically what he's saying is that if you go down the domestic debt restructuring rabbit hole, you will have a high chance of hurting the little guy, which will in fact create the same kind of unrest that initially led to the need for the nation to be, rest uh, to be restructuring its debt. 
basically by doing this he argues you will be at square one now this is said by the guy who negotiated our 2.9 billion dollar loan with the imf so it is coming directly from the imf i'm not making this up it also beats the question isn't it why are we doing the same old thing in the same old way just with new packaging this time around I think it was Einstein who said um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Joining me now is the opposition member of parliament, Iran Vikramarathna. Thank you very much uh, sir, for your time. Um, now that the domestic debt restructuring proposals are being uh, ratified by parliament and the discussions are underway with the creditors, the opposition who initially said that the restructuring is the way ahead is now parliamentarian saying that proposals put forward by the government and the central bank is faulty. Why are you saying this now? Uh, Mahesh, it's uh, interesting that you asked that question. We have always been supportive of going to the IMF and then uh, debt restructuring needs to be done. The government told us constantly that they will not be doing domestic debt restructuring. So debt restructuring needs to be done. So they suddenly came up with a proposal which said treasury bills in the central bank they will convert into bonds and the bonds they said they will also look at restructuring that. Now un unfortunately they focused only on the bonds held in the employees provident fund. That is really the big issue here because the employment provident fund will take a big hit. Now, uh, most people who save in the employees provident fund, uh, I would say more than 90 percent of them, this will be their single saving in life. They work 30, 40 years, they go to work every day, they live with dignity, they look after their kids, educate them, their parents, their grandparents and live with dignity. If they live another 20, 25, 30 years, then they are dependent on the EPF balance in actually doing it. And that is why we feel that it is unfair. So the, really the question is not the debt restructuring. One is why are we doing a domestic restructuring and if you had to do a domestic debt restructuring, why have you confined it only to members of the employees provident fund. Private people have benefited from it. If you are privately invested in it, you have actually benefited greatly from it because you get the higher returns. In addition to that, if you, uh, you, know, you, you try to safeguard the banks, that was your argument. But the owners of the banks, windfall gains because stock prices have risen on that. So the whole issue here is a question of equity. There is no equity in this and therefore we are, that is the reason we are very critical of the way in which they, they, they have gone about the, doing this. Not so much in the principle but and how it has actually been done. Understood. Uh, parliamentarian, didn't the SJB collaborate uh, even in committee stages to form this proposal? Because if you did, have your recommendations uh, been included? Uh, actually, I think you use the wrong word. Uh, you don't use the word collaborate because we don't collaborate. Proposals come from government. Governments are the executive arm and governments put forward proposals. The IMF agreement was an ag agreement negotiated by the government. They had it first at the working level with the officials of the IMF. We were not shown that. Then suddenly the president arrives in parliament and it's a done deal, it's a signed deal and he reveals it to parliament and when he revealed it to parliament only we come to know about it. So there's no question about collaboration. In principle, we were all for going for the IMF, we had been screaming and shouting about it for two years but actual transaction was done by government. When it came to the debt restructuring, it's no different. They completely told us that they will not be going for domestic debt restructuring and from the beginning I came out publicly about a year ago when there was a hint by the president that you might need to even take a haircut. I came publicly and said no way that we are going to tolerate a haircut. We are a country has gone through a crisis, right? The complete mismanagement, printing of money, inflation soared, food inflation to 100 percent, general inflation 70 percent. If you or I had a saving, that saving had already been halved in terms of value because of inflation. So we have already uh, taken our hit. So there was no question of collaboration. We Once they were going to do it, then they came in and said this is what we are going to do. From the moment they said that, from the first discussion we said what we are, first is we are surprised that you are doing domestic debt restructuring because there are three things they had to do. One is they have to get the, uh, g the, the debt, overall debt as a percentage of GDP, it is about 128 percent. Middle income country should get to 60, in the, in the mid term we should get to 95 percent. Then the gross financing need had to be brought down to 13 percent, right, which they 
said they can't do without doing domestic debt restructuring and then debt servicing is needed and cash flow is needed about 17 billion dollars they told us is needed to be saved in the process but we have never collaborated once they told us this then we brought the question of equity and we said this is not fair if you have to do it do it in a fair way so that private people don't benefit but and just don't take a hit only at the workers in the country it might cause social instability absolutely understood uh, that very clearly uh, thank you very much uh, parliamentarian we have to leave it at that uh, that was member of parliament from the opposition samagi janapalavik eran vikramaratna now, I want to get more insights from the business community on these proposals. And when I say business community, I mean the small and medium enterprises of this nation and not the 1% whom we recently saw praising this proposal, mainly because uh, they are not affected by it much. Joining me now is the chairman of the Sri Lanka United National Business Alliance, Tanya Abe Sundara. Thank you very much, madam, for your time. Good to see you. Uh, point blank. Are you happy with the domestic debt restructuring proposal and what are your reasons if you are not okay with it? Thank you, uh, Manish. Good evening and thank you, Darana, for having me once again. It's always a pleasure being with Darana. Yes, it, it is a very important question that you asked us. Are we happy? And what are we at right now? We are not happy at all. As as a whole, uh, we as SMV, that is the small and medium entrepreneurs, are being murdered and shrunk and put into a situation where we have no longer air to breathe. Now, if you were to take uh, the today's current situation, uh, we as SMV, generally we are the economical backbone. I mean, SMV is called the economical backbone in every part of the world, and so is in Sri Lanka because we host uh, nearly 4.5 million workforce and we contribute to the country's GDP, 52% to the country's GDP. So that in whole is a huge uh, uh, contribution that we pay towards the country's economical uh, strength. Now the government, the policies that they have been taking and they have been implementing and when the government called uh, the country bankrupt uh, nearly eight to nine months, nearly a year back, what was the exact situation of the country? No, the country's uh, inflation was at 36 percent. And soon as you call the country uh, bankrupt, the inflation went up from 36 to 80, 90 percent. So who created the inflation? There was never inflation. That inflation was created by the government. So I still stand to say the country was never bankrupt country was still not bankrupt it's that the country was never bankrupt the government was bankrupt and the government made the central bank bankrupt because most of the funds that are supposed to be generated to the country's economy was utilized for the government so that was the reason that the country went into bankruptcy Absolutely. Uh, Madam, uh, very quickly, we are short of time. Uh, what do you anticipate in the next few months due to the restructuring effort, especially uh, I I with regard to the domestic debt? Uh, I would seriously, very shortly, I know you are running out of time. I will try to explain this to very shortly. Uh, Mahesh, what I believe is uh, our SMV has been uh, uh, virtually uh, contracted uh, to about 40% of the SMVs have been uh, in a, like, you know, 30% have been shut down. Another 20% is struggling and another 10% will be shutting down very soon. So if you were to take wholly about 50 to 60% of the SMV is very badly affected. Now, why due to the wrong decisions taken by the central bank? Why was the decisions taken? Because they were trying to uh, control uh, uh, inflation, uh, what was created by the government but through suppressing the SMV and that is exactly what they are doing right now. Now the interest have gone up so highly. They are restructuring the SMV debts. I am asking the government if you were to restructure the debts at a percentage of 16 to 17 percent okay and the new loans that anybody would try to acquire would go up to about 23 percent. That is a uh, PLR rate plus uh, 2% to 3% would be the 23%. Now, I am asking Mahesh, how can somebody borrow at a rate of 23% and a debt that is being restructured at a percentage of 16 to 15 to 16%? Now, our liabilities in hold are more than our incomes that has been uh, we generate because the utility bills have gone up by 300%. Bank interest from one digit to went up to absorbent amount for 36 to 40 percent 
and the secondly uh, the dollar fluctuation has been affecting us so badly that uh, we have been having goods raw materials accessories that was bought for nearly 400 rupees and when the dollar keeps fluctuating well, very unorthodoxly uh, we are the people who suffer it's not the multinational companies so putting all this into consideration it's one huge basket against the emptiness of a little bit of oxygen the government is trying to give us so we are being intoxicated by so much of carbon dioxide and we are trying to you know have a little bit of oxygen so can we breathe can the economy survive you have to realize Mahesh if the SMV falls the country will collapse and today the SMV is drowning falling and it's been murdered because we are the biggest taxpayers and these tax are the ones that keep the government going it's not the multinational companies these people can always go into another country set up business because their business won't collapse but if you were to take the SMVs, we have to depend within the country. The country is our backbone and the, the country has to realize if the SMV collapses, economical backbone will collapse and the country will be dead before you know. Yes, makes uh, a lot of sense. Let's leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the chairman of the Sri Lanka United National Business Alliance, Tanya Andesundra. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now, one indicator that the IMF is pushing with its reforms in Sri Lanka is the privatization of state assets, just like what we discussed uh, at the beginning of the program where Sri Lanka Telecom Omtel was put up for sale despite making uh, being a profit-making entity. Joining me now is the Emeritus Professor in Management at the London campus of Loughborough University, Professor Jeffrey Hodgson. He is also an author and uh, will release a new book titled The Wealth of a Nation, which will be published in September of this year. He joins me via Zoom from London, UK. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for joining. Um, really appreciate it. Now, first, uh, privatization and non-state involvement have been the unique selling point in Sri Lanka, uh, mainly because uh, of the involvement of the IMF. What exactly should we make of this? Is there a different pathway other countries have followed that benefited them? Yes, privatization can only work if it's properly regulated. We have many examples of failure to regulate privatized companies properly. And we have exa other examples where it's worked fairly well. So privatization is not a magic solution. You do need regulation to make it work. Uh, understood. Professor, uh, we see that the US dollar is crashing in many parts of the world and several countries are seeking different trading methods like the BRICS nations. Uh, should a country like Sri Lanka also consider changing the uh, changing and adopting novel practices like that? Yes, there's a lot of discussion of things like cryptocurrencies, but I think as we say, the jury's out on whether they're workable. I think we have to, for the time being, work within the currency system we have, which means that many countries also are going to rely on the dollar. So I, I wouldn't see any quick solutions in this area. Absolutely. Professor, finally, uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your findings in your latest book uh, and the key lessons a country like Sri Lanka could learn from it? Yes, thank you. Um, my book is about how England or Britain became developed in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. And what I emphasize in the book is several things, including the following. One is the importance of for finance and financial institutions and in economic development. And th these are hard to build up, I know, in developing countries. And it took a long time in my country, but it's very important. There's also another thing is a state administration that works well including the rule of law. Again, it's easy to say and very difficult to do. But this, again, is something which developing countries have to look at carefully, which they're already doing so. But I know it's a hard job, and it shows in my country that it took a long time 
to build these things up. But developing countries can learn from the experience of other countries, even though sometimes the situation is very different. Absolutely. All right. We have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the Emeritus Professor in Management at the London campus of Loughborough University, Professor Jeffrey Hodgson. Now, another area of focus of the IMF is its effort to meddle with our internal affairs in establishing an anti-corruption process that will address key leakages in economies like Sri Lanka. Of course, yes, it's very true that Sri Lanka needs to work on curbing corruption, especially in the state sector. But how those laws are drawn should be in a manner that favours this nation. Last week, the parliament gave uh, its seal of approval for the new limited anti-corruption bill. And joining me now to get more information on this bill is the chairman of the committee appointed by the Minister of Justice in relation to this anti-corruption bill. is also the former director general of the Commission to Investigate Allegations of Bribery and Corruption, President's Counsel Asar Jamana. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Uh, good to see you. Now, tell me, what would we see um, change in this landscape with the implementation of this anti-corruption bill. Uh, thank you very much, Mahesh, for raising those uh, very important issues. Uh, one of the key features in the new anti-corruption commission and the new anti-corruption bill is that the commission would be truly independent. For example, the commission will have a monitor independence. Uh, they have to prepare their estimates and submit to the parliament. And it is the parliament who would support those uh, estimates and provide funds from the treasury after consulting the Minister of Finance. That is number one. Number two, the commission would be truly independent and therefore they are entitled to recruit the best experts for the investigations. For example, uh, forensic auditors, forensic accountants, uh, forensic uh, uh, IT experts. Likewise, they can recruit those investigators. Those are very crucial. In addition to that, for the first time in our history, the Commission uh, will be given powers for prevention. That means they can look at any system in a government department and suggest to them that their system has to be changed. Their procedures have to be changed for the purpose of eradicating bribery and corruption. Then uh, for the first time, we have included private sector bribery. Then we have included conflict of interest. Uh, failure to give for conflict of uh, interest declaration is an offence. Then we will have uh, online asset declaration. The here and after asset declarations have to be submitted directly to the uh, bribery commission. They will verify the truthfulness of the asset declaration by being in touch with other government departments. So therefore, here and after it is not necessary for the public servants who are in the staff grade to submit their asset declaration manually. Even the politicians, even the president, the prime minister, the local government uh, uh, representative, provincial, uh, provincial council representative, they have to give asset declaration. And that is one of the key features uh, of the entire anti-corruption act. Uh, finally, uh, the whatever the uh, pending cases, whatever the pending investigation will be continued uh, in the transitional provision as per the previous law. So those are the key features in the new uh, anti-corruption bill. Understood. Uh, President's Council, one of the most uh, prominent accusations on this bill is that it doesn't address the efforts of catching the real perpetrators of corruption, but just catches the little guy. Your reactions? No, if you carefully examine, uh, you will understand it's a myth. If we are doing a job, it is not uh, uh, fitted with the international norms, what will happen? The, our work is being supervised by the UN ODC because we are a party to the UNCAC and during those review cycles, UNCAC, the UN ODC has recommended certain loopholes be filled immediately. So whatever we do, we, are, we have been in touch with the UN ODC and the international community and our own experience. So therefore, uh, this uh, bill will give more teeth for the investigators, more tea to the prosecutors. In addition to that, we have introduced uh, offences like conflict of interest, the private sector bribery, and uh, we have introduced whistleblower protection, uh, and we have given more powers for the investigators, use modern technology, and we are in specific uh, new special methods. So therefore, certainly, uh, this is a new piece of law that would strengthen not only the independence, the efficiency of the, this thing would be in, uh, improved by introducing this act. We have never, we have never deleted whatever the legal provision with regard to the perpetrators in the act. In fact, 
uh, we are going to introduce as I said earlier new asset uh, new uh, electronic asset declaration system. So, we have tried our level best with our limitations uh, to a certain extent to give the best because when you introduce a law one group would say this is not sufficient another group would say no giving too much of power to the commission is not enough why there can be arbitrary and capricious decisions that commission might be taken. Uh, so, therefore, we have to uh, for safeguard those decisions. So, having regard to all the concerns of the all stakeholders uh, that uh, we have introduced, still we are open. If there are any amendments uh, that can be incorporated to the present bill, uh, I think government would be much happier uh, to incorporate uh, all these amendments. Understood. All right. Uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was President's Council, Sarah Chairman, uh, on the new anti-corruption bill. Let's take a short commercial break. More State of the Nation right after this. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. I'm sure you are now well aware of BRICS nations. BRICS uh, represent an alliance between Brazil, Russia, China, India and South Africa. These five countries are considered uh, emerging economies and have formed a significant partnership to stimulate growth and development among their members. Uh, I recently saw a video um, that actually came out from CNN who are like calling this alliance a fake alliance. It, clearly shows that America is a little bit rattled about this. Next month, BRICS leaders are expected to attend the 15th BRICS summit in South Africa from the 22nd to the 24th of August 2023. However, Russian President, as you know, Vladimir Putin will not attend in person because of the warrant issued by America, oh, sorry, uh, International Criminal Court to arrest him. As we've been saying that our nation has been facing tough economic challenges lately, making Sri Lanka the perfect candidate for exploring alternative avenues to boost its growth by aligning itself with uh, nations like the BRICS nations, Sri Lanka could tap into a wide range of opportunities that would uh, fuel our economic revival. If the answer to our dollar crisis is selling more goods and services abroad, that BRICS nations possesses an expansive consumer market with a com combination population of around 3 billion people. The West is dying a slow death right now. It's not uh, prudent for Sri Lanka to keep banking on the West in the way we are doing. America is imploding with its uh, woke BS and on top Europe is falling apart and continues to fall into chaos due to a vast migration issues, just like what we saw in France. It, it, looking at BRICS, a good idea. That's a question we've been thinking for quite some time and we need to post and ask that question. Now, the former governor of the Central Bank who was uh, on Getriel a couple of weeks back had this to say. Watch. I think all those are useful pointers to where we could go, Mahesh, because having relationships, having bilateral arrangements, have multilateral arrangements are all useful in order to do what? to finally to grow. That is the most important thing in an economy. If you do not grow, then you cannot really filter down the benefits to the people. Because finally it has to be people who benefit by it, not just the 1%. 1% 1 has already benefited. The 99% for it to benefit, the cake has to be made bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is what you have to concentrate on. Well, that was the former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nimat Kabra. Let's get more insights. Joining me now is the director of the Belt and Road Initiative in Sri Lanka, Yasiru Ranaraja. Good to see you again, Yasiru. Thank you very much for being here. Now, recently, there was a massive conversation about BRICS nations wanting their own currency, but the BRICS Bank, I think uh, they said uh, it's not really happening in the near future. Now, Sri Lanka is very much cash strapped or dollar strapped. And all indicators show that those nations in the BRICS will be the top dog uh, in the near future, Yasiru. In your opinion, 
What can Sri Lanka harness from this union? Yes, thank you for having me, Mahesh, again. Uh, you raised several good points in that question. So one is, first you mentioned the, the, the boosting of BRICS. It has become a global argument or a global debate or a discussion between member states, uh, mainly because the instability happening in Europe and due to Russia's uh, sanctions. And uh, there's a glooming global south coming out as an independent body to challenge the global north in other financial terms. Apart from that, you mentioned Sri Lankan debt crisis. So if you take our external debt, we are, we are more dependent on ISBs, which was one of the main reasons for Sri Lanka's defaults. And uh, though it's mainly said Chinese uh, debt trap, but if you look at the numbers, main uh, issue we had was the ISB. So BRICS coming in as a whole unit would give the global south uh, much more room in order to negotiate and in order to form their resources and to develop their countries. So it would work as an alternative body towards, towards the existing global lending system. So apart from that, what can Sri Lanka harness through it? Uh, it varies because still BRICS is forming because BRICS has always been there for the last 10 years, but these few years it has, it has boomed and it has come to the top tables to come to some consensus between countries. But there are still frictions. We saw how India re responded towards the currency. There is China, which would not want uh, international currency through BRICS because they have huge investments in USDs. They have the reserves in, in USD. So still the argument is going on, but Sri Lanka should actually look at what's happening and uh, attend to the whole uh, BRICS summit or the BRICS movement uh, in a positive manner because it's one of the branches that Sri Lanka could attach to apart from Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative. These are very formative uh, areas that we could develop our country as well by getting uh, loans at a good rate. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, should uh, Sri Lanka put forward an application to join this alliance? But um, geopolitically, we see that the United States doing their level best to keep Sri Lanka in its uh, economic clutches. Yes, once again, you, uh, as you mentioned, our only rescue plan here is IMF and IMF. There is no other way, no other debate on the table. We are just complying with whatever uh, is given to us in the paper with with a lot of pressure because local communities in Sri Lanka are struggling a lot to go through these reforms. They are struggling economically uh, because these are very strong capitalist or market-based reforms that we are doing right now. So I don't think, as I said before, I don't think we should join BRICS at this time, but it's as in uh, Bangladesh is doing, we should voice again, voice for it as in it's a it's an opportunity or it's an uh, it's an opportunity for us to join in the future so that we could always grant a debate uh, or always have good leverage over it uh, i had to recall where the south african president uh, during last week uh, made a comment on the paris uh, conference he said that BRICS currency is coming up and he he sort of played the BRICS card so it, it sort of being a bargaining card for the global south so that you know the 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 normal the western or the uh, uniform funding structure global funding structure multilaterals would align their tough um, you know sanctions and tough uh, economic reform policies and uh, a bit uh, flexible it would flexible they would be come to the global south so in some more flexible terms so that is what the global south needs much more flexible working uh, spirit uh, among the nations. So, uh, going back to the question, I think Sri Lanka should actually uh, look into it. Uh, apart, apart from that, we are looking at ASEAN, we are looking at there is Belt and Road Initiative, apart from that there is the Indian Rim Association. So, all these are good uh, organizations which are happening which should focus on different areas. So, BRICS would be sort of a financial, uh, alternative financial model that Sri Lanka should, could uh, in the future formulate uh, into. All right, we have to leave it at that. Appreciate it, Yasiru. That was the director of the Belt and Road Initiative in Sri Lanka, Yasiru Branaraja. We'll take a short break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a minute.
Sri Lanka, a land of rich culture, breathtaking landscapes and resilient people. But today our paradise faces a crisis and economic challenge that tests our determination and resilience. The road ahead may seem daunting, but remember every crisis offers a chance for rebirth. It's time for us to roll up our sleeves, unite as a nation and work hard to repave our way to prosperity in times like these. It's crucial to take action. So what can we do to overcome this economic crisis? The answer is simple. Support local businesses by purchasing locally made products. We can stimulate our economy and empower our fellow Sri Lankans, thus far giving an economy to re uh, revive itself. Be it handicrafts, textile or even fresh produce, every rupee spent here makes a difference. You have to buy locally, buy Sri Lankan. That is something we need to determine to do. Sri Lanka's current economic crisis is winnable, in my opinion, and it starts with each one of us. Together, let's work hard, embrace creativity, and turn this crisis into an opportunity for growth. Well, do get in touch with us as we would like to hear your views, feedback, and suggestion. You can write to us about anything you saw on the program. You agree, disagree, please send us your comments to State of the Nation at derana.lk I'm Mahish Johnny from all of us at Adha Derana 24. Have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you again on Tuesday on Get Real. See you then. Bye for now.